What photonics is, it's the science of light. Photonics is about manipulating photons. And it's interesting, photonics hasn't been around for a very long time. It's, it's probably really only invented in the 1960s. It followed up very closely to electronics. And the idea was electronics was really starting to take off in the 1960s and they had integrated circuits. And you started to be able to do a lot of things like amplifiers and, and radios and, and there was a lot of development there. Photons had the same sort of promise. The laser was invented in 1960 by, by Ted Maiman. And the idea was, well, what can we do with photons? And that was the real start of it. But prior to that, there had been a lot of work in other areas which have really fed into it. Optics. Classical optics have been around for a thousand years. They've been designing lenses for glasses for a thousand years. Newton in the uh, 1700s, again, talked a lot about optics. So optics has been very well known for a, for a long time. But photonics is a lot more than optics. Lasers is, is a key part of photonics. There's another key area, which is quantum electronics, um, which is an area I won't go into today, but that is, that's been critical. The development of quantum theory has really allowed photonics to develop. Detectors have improved a lot, so now you can see individual photons very easily and, and measure them. Um, and then there's been some work in fibres and materials, which I'll talk about here. So really, photonics is photon engineering. It's taking photons and using them to measure the world um, measure the world and do things with them. So in terms of light, what is light? Well, you can talk about light, probably the best description of light is that it's part, it's energy, it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And well, I should just touch on the definition I found, which I thought was neat, but it was the natural agent that simulates, that stimulates sight and makes things visible. And that's what light is. We've, our eyes have evolved to see the light. Um, and for instance, the eye responds a very, in a, across a very narrow band of this radiation. If you look in the, the spectrum there, we see the visible, which is a tiny little bit. We can see from red through until uh, the blue. So we can see red in the infrared down in, into blue. And that corresponds to the peak emission of the sun. So our eyes have evolved to be able to see the peak light coming out of the sun. But as you can see, the spectrum is, is much broader than that. And really, uh, photonics is infrared to the ultraviolet. That's generally what we're talking about when we talk about photonics. To illustrate about you know, light being energy, I, I think it's, you know, we see a very small part of the spectrum. But if you see a fire burning, say a forest fire, it's interesting. You can actually feel that fire in a lot of cases before you can see it. You can be 100 metres away from a fire front and you can actually feel it hitting you. And that's just light. That's infrared light hitting you. And yeah. that is, that's what causes a lot of flash fires and things like that. There is that much intensity coming out of a fire in these regions that we can't see. How you work with it is you have different models to understand light. You can talk about it in wave-like properties. Light is a wave, but it can also have particle-like properties. It travels in rays in a, in a lot of cases. It will travel in, in straight lines. But it will also diffract around different objects, the same as, a, as any wave would, an acoustic wave or even an ocean wave. Again, you see what's called diffraction effects. And I'll go into that a little bit further in, in this presentation. So how can it be both? Um, it's, it has properties of both. It isn't both, okay. but it can be described by thinking about it as a particle or thinking about it as a wave. Um, so it has those properties, but it's more complex than either of, of those. There's quite a few theories that go into it. The full theory of electromagnetic, ma electromagnetism describes it um, fairly comprehensively. Okay. And I'll just show down below a couple of those properties. One is diffraction. You can see this is, is the red graph there shows diffraction from an aperture, from a rectangular aperture. And the second property there is how it interacts with materials. And I'll just show a prism there. That's uh, the cover from Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon. And, it, and it's interesting that you actually get uh, refraction of the light through there. So the light actually interacts with the material and travels at different speeds. So different colours can be, are in a white light source and it will travel through this prism and it can be uh, refracted into the different colours. The next area I wanted to talk about, and this is one of the key enablers of photonics, are lasers. This is, this is my area that I've worked in for over 20 years. And a laser itself can be described, it really needs two components. You need a laser medium, this, and I'll talk about this, and you need a cavity. You need mirrors around that, which allows the light to, to build up. 
And I'll just show there you know, the essence of, of a laser. All lasers are of some variation on that form. Underneath is just a, a, a picture of one of the lasers operating. So a laser medium, what, what is a medium? What types of mediums? Uh, a medium can be a gas, a liquid, or a solid. And within that is suspended the actual lasing atoms. And I'll, I'll go into that in the next slide. But a medium is just a way of holding the atoms that end up undergoing the lasing transition. And note, everybody, that that's an S, not a Z. It is, because <laughs> uh, it's probably, it has been lost, I guess, but it, originally it was a, um, an acronym, uh, Laser Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. And this was uh, put together by uh, Maiman in 1960, and this came from, the it came from the MASER, which was a microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, which was discovered in, in the 50s. So the laser process itself, I've just uh, got a little bit of science here, but what I really want to convey was the special characteristics of, of a laser. And the essence of a laser is that you need to have a, an atom and you can excite this atom. And what happens is if you can have an excited atom, you can then, by passing a photon through this atom or interacting a photon with the atom, you can actually get the atom to emit a photon which is identical. So uh, with a laser, it produces photons that are identical. They are in phase. They wiggle at the same speed, and they have okay. this exactly the same colour. So they're the two properties of a laser. They're what's called coherent, or they wiggle at the same speed, and they have the same colour. And you can see here from going before emission, during emission, and after emission, that it's an, an atomic process. Then if you put mirrors around this type of, these types of atoms, you can build up that field very quickly. That is how a laser works. Okay, so we're literally talking about um, essentially a cylinder, a mirror at either end, and what have we got happening on the inside? Can you just again just talk me through what might okay. be on the inside? Uh, well, on the inside of that may be a crystal. The first laser itself was a, was a ruby crystal, um, and it just had mirrors around it and the light bounced backwards and forwards, and that was excited by a flash lamp. And that was probably okay. the image that first got me a passion for lasers when I was in high school. Seeing that image of a ruby laser from 1960 was, well, how do you, how do you make those? And those lasers are, incident, are, are still around and still being used today, those types of lasers. It produces a very nice red colour, which is used for removing port stain um, birthmarks and things like that on skin uh, because it's so strongly absorbed by those. Okay, next area I'd like to touch on is um, describe is optical fibres. We're surrounded by optical fibres. Um, the internet is built on optical fibres. If it wasn't for the breakthrough in optical fibre, we wouldn't have the internet as it is today. Um, optical fibres have massive bandwidth. A single fibre can transmit up to 400 DVDs per second on a, on a single fibre. To actually get to that took hundreds of years of development. The first optical fibre was a light guide in water. And this was uh, 1842, I show here on the presentation here. But it was an intricate experiment set up with a projector, a lens, and a parabolic stream of water. And it, they actually showed that you could guide light in, in that water. And that was a very significant result. Then it took up until the 1970s to actually realize a fiber that was low enough loss. Um, what does that mean? What it means is you need, when you put light into a fibre, you want it all to come out the other end. And right. to do that, you're putting light into solid glass. And so there needed to be a process to come up with a glass that was pure enough that you could do this. And there was an invention of a new process to make glass in the 1970s where you could get losses of only a few percent per kilometre. So could you imagine a kilometre of glass, this glass is so pure that if you look through it, only 3% of the light would be lost. That is what's in optical fibre today. Wow. And interestingly, they make, there is massive amounts of fibre being made. I just list there, production is about 24 million kilometres per year of optical fibre. About half of that is in China at the moment. They're, they're putting down a lot of optical fibre for communications. But considering the circumference of the world, is, uh, the Earth is about 40,000 kilometres, um, you know, you're, you're, several, you're talking going around the world several hundred times per year in optical fibre we're making now. So I'll just move on now to some of the uh, applications of photonics. Uh, they, inclu they include data storage, the internet, um, fibre sensors, laser radars, laser machining, 
defense and molecular sensing. So I'll just touch on a couple of these. Uh, I'll show here an optical fiber. This is a fiber that's been developed at IPAS at University of Adelaide. And it's an optical fiber made of glass, the same as a telecommunications fiber. Mm -hmm. And in this fiber, we have a very small core. And you can see in that top diagram, we have 125 micron diameter fiber, which is about the same as a human hair. Then in there, we have a core, which is around four microns or four millionths of a meter diameter. And that guides the light. That's like a light rail. And then that allows the light to interact with anything around the fiber. So we can use that for sensing gases. So we can pass particular colors of light down there that we know interact with particular gases or liquids. So we can use that for uh, chemical detection, for instance. We use it to monitor hydrogen peroxide in fuel. We can also use it to monitor um, hydrogen peroxide in human eggs, for instance, as well. We can look at very small liters of particular chemicals, very small volumes of particular chemicals. Okay. So other work we're looking at is a, what we call a smart wine, wine bung. This, again, was developed at IPAS. And uh, this is Adelaide. There's a massive wine industry here. Absolutely. And a lot of winemaking is still fairly traditional. They actually take out, they uncork the barrels and take out wine to measure um, the characteristics, measure the sulfur, me measure the sugar, measure the alcohol. We've developed a process where the bung has an optical fibre inside of it and you don't have to expose it to air, you don't have to take any chemicals out or any solution, and then you can monitor things such as the temperature, the pH or the acidity, or, and the alcohol content and sugar content, uh, or sulphur, for instance. So that's some new work we've, we've been developing over the last few years. Another area we're interested in, um, which has, again, massive um, potential in the real world, are laser radars. I don't know if you've um, seen some of the, the imagery it's, uh, of laser radars, but what it allows you to do is send out pulses of light. We make, uh, we're working with, with a number of companies. One is, is MapTech, an Adelaide company. But you can produce pulses of light that are about a nanosecond long, which is a billionth of a second long. And you send those out and bounce them off things. And you send out a lot of these, um, these pulses at rates of 100,000 pulses per second and collect the returns. And that allows you to get centimetre scale accuracy in a 3D map. Um, and there's a lot of work happening in that. And this is an application looking at open cut mines, which is uh, very valuable. But there's a lot more work now happening about actually putting these on cars, for instance, as well. And what would they do on cars? You're giving you a picture of what's around and the car? give you a complete picture of what's around the car. The Google, Google car, for instance, now yep. the Google car, has a 3D laser radar on it, which is, okay. again, fascinating because it allows it to have what I call situational awareness. By a computer looking at that, it can see if anything is, is close by, and so it knows where the other cars and all the other buildings are. And so that's how it doesn't crash into things. Um, and in the future, you could imagine by having those types of sensors on cars, you have a built-in safety system. Absolutely. The other area that lasers are very big at is laser machining. Uh, this is just a, a video here showing um, uh, laser machining of, of metals. Um, nowadays, lasers are being used for cutting and processing all types of materials, from metals to plastics. Um, and it's used quite regularly now. Most, a lot of car welding is done using lasers, particularly in Germany. Most ships now in modern shipyards are made using lasers as well. So it's, it's another massive area where lasers are adding a lot of economic value. Very accurate and very clean process, isn't it? Very clean. There's, you know, compared to normal welding, it's, it's much cleaner. There's no impurities. Um, much cleaner. This is an interesting photonics application. This is a passive application. And this is um, some footage of the new Joint Strike Fighter out of Lockheed Martin. And what that has are a number of cameras working in the infrared, in the thermal band, and actually in the mid-infrared to be accurate. And they're placed around the aircraft, and then the images are processed and, and put together. This is more than interesting. This is quite amazing, really. This allows the pilot to know exactly what's happening because this is projected then on their heads up, to, on their visor. And so by the pilot actually looking around, they have this false vision, thermal vision, where they can look around the entire hemisphere of where the aircraft is. Um, and so it gives, again, great situational awareness. Um, because it's... I'll get the right one in a second. Because it's um, working in the mid-infrared, it allows you to see heat. So they can see missiles coming in, they can see gunfire, and they can see people on the ground. And 
So this is really, this is photonics, but it's also the amalgamation of photonics and image processing. Um, some very smart image processing. Amazing array of applications. And then the further applications of taking this technology out of defence, for example, and putting it elsewhere into the Google car, into other areas. Quite yeah, mind-blowing. It is. All right. Thank you very much for that quick little um, talk about what photonics is and its applications. Let's find out about your career. How on earth did you get into photonics? Um, as I mentioned before, I was, I was originally at high school fascinated by lasers. Um, but at that stage, it, it probably took me towards more of a, fascina towards a fascination of physics and, and sort of that moved behind me and I went on to study physics and maths. I went to Coffs Harbour High School. Um, yeah. Really enjoyed physics and maths. The career teachers, career advisors said to me, well, you're good at those subjects, you should be an engineer. So I actually went off to the University of New South Wales to do electrical engineering. Um, I did that for two years. I have to say I didn't fit in as an engineer. It didn't appeal to me. Um, I then left uni to work out what I wanted to do. And at that mm -hmm. stage, I decided I'd do science and, and do physics because that is something that always fascinated me, but I had no idea what the career prospects Isn't were. Isn't there a lot it of was... physics in engineering? There is, but it's, there's a lot of other things in engineering as well. Physics is, is, is one part of it that you move on from and you keep certain equations, but it's, it's not the same way of thinking. It doesn't have the same dependence on um, deriving from the fundamentals, you know, working really from first principles, which appeals to me a lot more about physics uh, and a lot more about the science process. So I went on and did science, but really had no idea where it was going to take me. Okay. And so how... Um how did you choose then the photonics? Uh, well, for, I went on, uh, I finished my undergraduate degree and at that point I was looking around to do a PhD and a PhD came up, it was an industry funded PhD in developing a laser for detecting methane on um, compressed natural gas carriers, it was a BHP project. Mm -hmm. And that sort of re reawakened my, hey, that's what I want to get into lasers. So I then went to Macquarie University and started a PhD in this area of developing a laser to be able to detect methane in, in the atmosphere. And, and that sort of then led on to continuing work to, do, to develop sensors or laser sensors to be able to detect different gases in the atmosphere. So that uh, love of lasers from such a young age sort of eventually came back to you. It did. At the it core. Uh, what's one of the most amazing things that you've done in your job? Uh, well. Probably one of the highlights was um, when I was a, a postdoctoral fellow. After doing a PhD at Macquarie, I then moved to the US. I moved to Rice University, which is in Houston. And I was working on a project there co-funded by NASA. And it was, um, they actually had a ground chamber, which I just show in this slide here. I don't have time to go through all the details. But they had a ground cha chamber where astronauts were basically locked up there for up to three months. And they were testing survival systems for putting astronauts on Mars. And it's a big pressure chamber. And they had issues about, well, what are the gases in there? What are the concentrations? And so we looked into a particular gas of interest, which was formaldehyde. Um, because formaldehyde's a carcinogen, causes cancer. And then it's also an irritant at about one part per million. You know, formaldehyde's that smell you get in new cars. Um, yep. It's used as a foaming agent for carpets, for instance, and, it's used, and it occurs in sick building syndrome. But we found we could actually detect it at harmful levels inside of this chamber, and we found it came from the insulation foam that they used. And that then, um, NASA then changed the foam they were using for their space station and things like that after that. So that was fairly exciting. Absolutely. So you've contributed to our um, pursuit in living in Mars. Very nice. That's not a bad thing to have in your career CV. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, what about a typical day in your job these days? A uh, typical day? Well, it's, it's a mixture. It has facets of sort of corporate life. Um, like everywhere, there's, there's a lot of email to do. Yeah. There's you know, standard corporate you know, meetings. Um, there's working with students. A large part of the job is actually uh, writing. It was something I wish I'd really appreciated at high school, that as a scientist, mm. English is, is critical. I write for more than an hour a day. Sometimes I'll write for 12 hours a day because it's writing up grant applications, writing up publications, writing up talks. It's yep. key. So writing skills and grammar are absolutely critical. It was interesting. My Texas professor taught me a lot of grammar uh, when I was a postdoc there. So it was something I learned. But then I also get to spend time in the lab. I'm an experimentalist. 
I get to spend three or four hours a day, if I'm lucky, in the lab. You know, so. And we've got a clip here of... Is this the lab that you work oh, in? This is one of the laser labs I work in. Mm. Uh, is that uh, you, uh, by chance? Uh, yeah, and my student goggles? Sebastian. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they're the height of fashion, actually, the laser goggles. Fabulous. So, uh, totally fabulous. But this is some, uh, yeah, again, this is a, a laser lab and we're developing here. Um, it's the small little green glow you can see. There is a, is a small waveguide laser we've developed. That green is the lasing atoms emitting light. Uh, we've developed that glass in IPAS at University of Adelaide and we also we make the lasers there as well. So before when you were talking about uh, people developing that really amazingly clear, pure glass, yep. you're actually trying to produce your own pure glass as well? We make our own very, very pure glasses. We've got probably some of the best glass making facilities in Australia, so we can make ultra, ultra pure laser glass. And we can also make optical fibres um, out, of, out of this glass as well. And okay. we make our own fibre glass for sensing applications yep. and for laser applications.